What if the entire story of the Slavic people was wrong? Slavs. Over 300 million people across Europe. But who were they? Really? Vikings? Steppe warriors? Something darker? For the first time, genetics is answering questions history couldn't. And the truth? It's wilder than you think. Despite centuries of migration and mixing, still share a powerful genetic connection. If you're Slavic, this is your story written in your genes. They speak 20 languages, live in over a dozen countries, and yet their genetic fingerprint tells one connected story. Evidence suggests that they possibly came from Eastern Europe and Palatia region. You've heard of Russians and Poles, but what if I told you the Slavs actually split into three tribes, each shaped by their own genetic destiny? One tribe went north into the snow-covered forests, another moved west, clashing with the last remnants of Rome, the third, vanished into the mountains of the Balkans. Today, we call them East, West, and South Slavs. But the question is how their origins are not bound to only one specific region, but rather whole world. The answer to this question lies in their wholesome DNA. Their DNA? It's like a time capsule, part warrior, part farmer, part myth. And it's reshaping everything we thought we knew about Europe. But here's what shocked scientists. DNA didn't just reveal who the Slavs were, it exposed how they spread, who they mixed with, and what made them unlike any other group in Europe. Their DNA analysis is like taking off the veil from unsettling and unbelievable mysteries from the past. Historians thought the Slavs came from swamps. DNA says otherwise. Now here's where it gets really strange. One genetic marker, R1A, may just be the key to unlocking their origin. But it's not that simple. But how the Indo-European and Slavs are related well, this is another level of mystery, but it's a relevant story that tells us more about Slavic history. Long before the names of modern nations were spoken, before the rise of Rome or the birth of written language, there was a land of wide open skies and endless grasslands. This was the Pontic Caspian Steppe, stretching across modern day Ukraine and Southern Russia. And here, some 5,000 years ago, lived a people known only through a reconstructed memory, the Proto-Indo-Europeans. Their migrations, which began around 3000 to 2500 BCE, were nothing short of world shaping, like ripples spreading through time. They moved outward, north, south, east, and west, seeding the future that will rewrite the European history. As the Proto-Indo-Europeans moved west into Europe, one of the key cultures they gave rise to was the Corded Ware culture. Flourishing between 2900 and 2350 BCE, burial mounds, battle axes, and cord-patterned pottery mark their legacy, but it's in their genetics that we find the true significance. People of the Corded War culture carried Yamnaya Steppe DNA, a lineage that future Slavic populations would also inherit. The bloodline was set. As centuries passed, the descendants of the Corded Ware peoples settled deeper into the dense, river-laced forests of Eastern Europe. By the first millennium BCE, their likely homeland was nestled near the Pripyat marshes, a vast, watery landscape spanning parts of modern Belarus, Ukraine, and Poland. These forest steppe dwellers lived in scattered tribes. They farmed the land, fished the rivers, and worshipped gods tied to nature. The thunder of Perun, the fertility of Mokosh, the dark mysteries of Veles. Though still carrying the Indo-European spirit in their myths, language, and traditions, they were becoming something new. They were becoming Slavs. By the first millennium CE, the unique voice of the Slavic people began to rise. The Proto-Slavic language, born of Indo-European roots, started to take shape. It was more than just words, it was identity. It would soon branch into the languages we know today, Russian, Polish, Bulgarian, Ukrainian, Serbian, Czech, Slovak, but in these early days, it was still a single shared tongue. In the aftermath of the Roman Empire's fall, Europe entered an era of upheaval, the migration period. This migration likely influenced and flowed the Europe with mixing cultural legacies and values. The Slavic people also flowed like water expanding gradually through population. This wasn't just a migration, it was a split. The Slavic world fractured into three tribes, each heading into a different destiny. To the west, they reached Poland, Czechia, and Slovakia. To the south, they poured into the Balkans, mingling with fading Roman legacies, to the east, they wandered into the shadowed woodlands of Russia, stretching ever further. And that's how they diversified among the various groups of Europe and gave a rise to a unique DNA. 
but the shock and mystery doesn't end just here. With this migration comes the interaction with other cultures, and these interactions gave rise to new kingdoms, markers, and genetic legacy that proves a point. This gave rise to a medieval Slavic kingdom. In the early 9th century, West Slavic Kingdom was made up of local Slavic tribes, with some mixing from Germanic people and Avars, a nomadic group. The region also had Frankish, Western European cultural influences, suggesting some intermarriage and cultural blending. But the shocker isn't what they found, it's what it means. Within 9th to 13th century, Kievan Rus was formed by East Slavs and Norse Varangians, Vikings from Scandinavia. This kingdom saw the Norse ruling elite mix with the Slavic population. Over time, they blended culturally and genetically. But before that, in 7th century, First Bulgarian Empire was founded by Turkic-speaking Bulgars. This state gradually became Slavic, as the Bulgars merged with the local Slavic majority. Today's Bulgarians reflect this mixed origin, but are mostly Slavic by language and genetics. And finally, later in 13th century, the Mongol invasions destroyed Kievan Rus and brought the Golden Horde to the region. While they left a small trace of Mongolic DNA in Eastern Slavs, it's a minor part of their overall ancestry. All of these invasions and interactions left amazing genetic markers within the Slavs that resulted how we view Slavs today. Modern Slavic DNA surprised scientists and geneticists, but it is diversified yet unique in its own way. What markers did they get from other nations and how their DNA is identified after so much mixing? The answer lies within their Y or paternal DNA, aka from dad's side plus mtDNA or mother's side DNA. Let's talk about Y DNA fist. They contain R1A, also known as Slavic male marker, mostly found within Poles, Russians, Ukrainians, Slovaks, and Belarusians. This most likely came from Indo-European steppe warriors, also known as Yamnaya culture. This works as a Slavic signature because this trait is unique that only true Slavic people could have. On the other hand, South Slavs have I2A marker, which is a fusion trait from Serbs, Croats, and Bosnians. Moreover, N1C is found in Northeast Slavs, like some Russians and Belarusians. This ties them to Uralic people, showing some northern blend. After viewing Y DNA, scientists were eager about mtDNA, or mom's side DNA, which in other words revealed a mystery. Main haplogroups like H, U, T, J, K, and W were found that shows a European mix. Surprisingly, this DNA markers came from hunter-gatherers, Neolithic farmers, and steppe nomads. Now this is much more uniform across Europe, so less regional variation among Slavs. In order to conclude, it's being said that Slavic DNA is a cocktail of steppe DNA from Yamnaya, hunter-gatherers, the OG Europeans, and a pinch of Neolithic farmers, which were early agri-folk from Anatolia. And this one detail? It rewrites everything. After intermixing, there must be some exchange of traits. Well, there is. Let's talk about what genetic traits are commonly found in Slavic populations. We're diving into that spicy intersection of biology and identity, not just where they come from, but what traits are influenced by their DNA. Mostly their hair are medium to dark brown, though lighter shades are also common, especially in northern eastern areas. Blue eyes are especially common in West and East Slavs. Green and hazel tend to pop more in South Slavs, as OCA2, HERC2 affect eye color while MC1R, involved in hair color, red hair less common but not absent. Many Slavic populations have straight or slightly aquiline noses, prominent cheekbones, and oval to round faces. Strong jawlines and broad foreheads are noted features, especially in South and East Slavic regions. Most modern Slavs have moderate to high lactose tolerance, especially West Slavs. South Slavs may have lower tolerance, depending on local ancestry. LCT gene allows digestion of milk sugars in adulthood. Slavic populations, especially those in northern areas, have evolved to process vitamin D more efficiently due to long winters and less sunlight. That's a smart adaptation to lower UV exposure. Think survival plus evolutionary flex. Linguistically, Slavic languages are complex with cases, aspects, and rich morphology. Some researchers believe exposure to such linguistic complexity from childhood may encourage stronger pattern recognition and cognitive flexibility. Genes like FOXP2, BDNF, and DRD4 show population-level variation across Europe, including among Slavs. Linguistically, Slavic languages are complex, with cases, aspects, and rich morphology. Historical and genetic adaptation to harsh climates, wars, and resource scarcity has bred strong resilience in both body and culture. 
Slavic populations show genetic markers tied to robust immune response. High representation of Slavic athletes in sports like gymnastics, fencing, combat sports, and chess suggests strong motor control, discipline, and strategic thinking, possibly reinforced by both genetic and cultural factors. Some researchers have even identified what they call Slavic supergenes, clusters of traits that may have helped ancient Slavs survive brutal winters, famine, and centuries of war. These include variants related to pain tolerance, stress response, and even dopamine regulation, which some link to heightened resilience, emotional depth, and creativity. In fact, recent studies show unusually high expression of genes tied to cold resistance in Slavs, similar to adaptations found in Arctic populations. It's almost like nature carved a people designed to endure. Interestingly, this intermingling didn't only affect the DNA but for sure the cultures and traditions too. These three Salvic groups are blended into the culture with their own traditions inclusive. This highlights a major influence within the time frame. So what makes a South Slav different from their northern cousins? Let's start with food. One word, burek. But that's just the beginning. Let's talk about West Slavs first. They use the Latin alphabet languages like Polish and Czech which are full of complex consonants. Most of them are predominantly Roman Catholic as they strongly emphasize on family, tradition, and Catholic holidays. Within this region they have big-time interaction with Germanic cultures, Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Western Europe. Their famous cuisines include pierogi, kielbasa, dumplings, and hearty stews. If we talk about East Slavs they use Cyrillic script, Ukrainian and Belarusian closer to Polish, Russian has more Church Slavonic, they mostly follow Eastern Orthodox. They impose strongly on community, endurance, and spirituality. Byzantium, Mongol rule, later Imperial Orthodox traditions left strong influence on them. For foodies out there, their favorite cuisines include borscht, pelmeni, kasha, blini, pickled everything. And for our South Slavs, they follow a rich family of dialects, written in both Latin and Cyrillic, depending on the country. Their religion are mostly Eastern Orthodox in Serbia, Macedonia, Montenegro, and Bulgaria, and Roman Catholic in Croatia and Slovenia. They honor hospitality and regional pride. They are deeply influenced by Byzantine, Ottoman, Austro-Hungarian, and ancient Balkan layers. They devour grilled meats, barek, rakia, paprika-based dishes. Just as their culture is interesting chapter, we cannot ignore the breakthroughs scientists witnessed when uncovering their unique DNA. Imagine scientists like detectives, peering into ancient bones, decoding letters written not in ink, but in genetic code. What they uncovered about Slavic DNA? Nothing short of epic. Ancient DNA pulled from 6th to 9th century cemeteries across Europe proved massive Slavic population movement. The genes themselves show up suddenly, like a new layer of paint across the map. These R1A lines became a biological tracer that maps where Slavic men spread, from Poland to Russia and into the Balkans. Genetic components tied to the Yamnaya steppe herders, Indo-Europeans, were found all over Slavic populations. This ties them to the same route as the people who brought horses, chariots, and PIE, Proto-Indo-European, across Europe. Ancient DNA from post-600 AD graves showed a genetic mix. Incoming Slavs blended with locals, like Thracians, Dacians, Illyrians. Result? A new South Slavic gene pool, still visible today in haplogroups like I2A DIN. Autosomal DNA patterns match linguistic divisions almost perfectly. East Slavs share DNA that's more Russian Uralic tinged, West Slavs look more Central European, and South Slavs have Balkan signatures. Slavic DNA research turned myths into measurable science. Every burial site, every genome adds to the ongoing epic, and we're now able to see, in stunning clarity, how a group of early tribes evolved into one of Europe's largest language families, with a unique, ancient genetic legacy. Their journey didn't end in the lost chapters of the past. Till this date, their genetics are still persisting to a slow, but a constant change. Modern Slavic people DNA showed a remarkable revelation among genetic society and Europe, carried R1AY DNA, still super common among Slavic men. The OG Europeans, dark-haired, blue-eyed, and living off the land long before farming arrived. This layer is ancient and present in all Europeans, including Slavs. Modern Slavs, like other Europeans, carry a strong farming legacy, both genetically and culturally. But the important thing is, this isn't just about their DNA. Rather, this is more about their rediscovery. 
Slavs today are rediscovering what was lost, hidden, or colonized, not to retreat into the past, but to move forward with purpose and pride. It's a renaissance, a return and a reminder that deep roots make strong trees, and the Slavic tree is thriving. The new Slavic identity isn't stuck in the past, it's modern, inclusive, and evolving. You'll find Slavs proudly celebrating their roots from Chicago to Sydney to Berlin. There's a growing diaspora movement connecting younger Slavs online, sharing heritage through memes, music, and memes with soul. In the face of globalization and homogenization, many Slavs are becoming more protective and proud of their languages, dialects, and local expressions. Moreover, there's a growing trend of Slavic mutual intelligibility projects people learning to understand different Slavic tongues, recognizing shared roots. What once seemed old-fashioned is now being embraced in art, fashion, and even Slavic TikTok and Instagram culture. Slavic aesthetics are a mood, earthy, mystical, rooted. Young people are mixing folk and modern, think traditional Slavic blouses with streetwear, or ancient lullabies sampled into trap beats. Across Slavic countries, People are rediscovering ancient pre-Christian traditions. The old gods, forest spirits, solstice festivals, and Slavic mythology once buried or suppressed. Festivals like Kupala Night, Ivan Kupala, once Christianized, are now celebrated for their pagan origins. Deities like Perun, Thunder God, and Mokosh, Earth Mother, are getting fresh attention in books, tattoos, fashion, and even video games. In recent years, some Slavs have embraced fringe theories, from claims of ancient Slavic empires hidden from history to lost technologies buried beneath Ukraine and Russia. While not backed by mainstream historians, these stories reveal something deeper, a hunger to reclaim a past that was often erased or overwritten by conquerors. Whether myth or metaphor, they're part of the Slavic resurgence. Their bloodlines shaped kingdoms, fought empires, and survived everything Europe could throw at them. So. How do you know if you've got Slavic DNA? Your grandma makes 40 types of dumplings, and everyone has a secret. You grew up with onion, garlic, and at least one Slavic swear word in the kitchen. You don't fear winter. You wear it like a badge. You've got cheekbones sharp enough to cut glass and eyes that hold entire poems. If that's you, maybe it's not just culture. Maybe it's genetic. And if you carry that DNA, you're not just part of history. You are history.